it's, uh, it's hard to believe I, I was thinking about this just a few days ago, that it's really been just uh, a little over a year since we, we planted Thrive and since we, we started. And, and the, the, the way that we've been able to see God work in some pretty incredible ways. And then, of course, like everything else in the world, coronavirus just, you know, jacked everything up. But we've continued to see God work in incredible ways, even, even through the, the mess. We've seen God provide, and I was, I was thinking about this, that I don't know that we do a good enough job right now of really celebrating the things that, that, that God does and the things that He has done in and through us and around us. And I was just thinking of all of the, the meals I've seen get delivered, uh, about 10 baptisms during the, during the uh, uh, quarantine period. Man, that's a gift to be a part of and to see to see people give their lives to Christ and to, to come to know Him as Lord. And, and stuff is still going. The, the uh, discussions on the building are happening right now and how, how's that going to take shape and, and what's that going to look like. Here's, can I go ahead and say this? Here's my only fear really with uh, the, the building. My fear is that once we build it, we would think that that was home. Let me tell you something. The Christian's home is in heaven. A, a, a building is a tool, much like a speaker or a keyboard. It, it's an implement that the church uses to, to do its mission. And it needs to be approached that way rather than, oh, now we have this, we turn inward. That would be a terrible, terrible tragedy. So we have to get that, make sure that, that we have that in our heads as we're going forward and as we're starting to build or we uh, start to work towards building. Because one thing that is blatantly obvious right now, we, we live in a very deeply divided and wounded country. It needs a deeply united and purposeful church. That's what our country needs more than, than anything right now. And so that's one of the reasons we're doing this series right now is so that we can challenge ourselves, what's it mean to, to be a follower of Jesus? What's it mean to, to follow Jesus rather than to just know about him? That's the purpose of why we're working through the book of Mark and honestly why we're about to start this uh, rooted discipleship plan as well. And, and I, I've got to say this, um, it is my prayer right now that every person who calls Thrive Home or even considering call, calling Thrive Home w would go through this. This is one of those studies that isn't, isn't just about what do I know about God, but how do I live for Jesus? How, how does that change life and, and I know that, you know, it's 15 bucks for the book. I, I will say this, if now's not a good time for that, we'd be happy to cover that. Or even if, if you're a student and you're thinking, well, well, I, we'll automatically cover that. Just to make sure that as many of us as possible so that we can drill down, get on the same page. Hey, this is what it means to follow Jesus. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, would, would you open it to Mark chapter 3? Or if you have that, that YouVersion Bible app, you know, if you have that YouVersion Bible app, all you have to do, you can go to, um, there's an events button on there, push on Thrive Church, and it'll have all of the text that we're going to be looking at uh, ready right there. Mark chapter 3. As we step into Mark, those who have been around for a bit, you may have heard um, either me or somebody else talking about this, there's a, a, an odd literary feature in the book of Mark. Uh, Mark does this. He'll start a story, stick another one in the middle, and then finish the first story. And it, he doesn't just do it once or twice. He does it like 11 times in the book. The, the technical term is a Mark sandwich. And you thank our Bible scholars for that. It's called a Mark sandwich. You know, let me give you an example. When he goes, um, there, there's a guy named Jairus who comes and says, hey, my, my child is dying. Will, will you help? Of course, so Jesus gets up. In the middle of that story, there's a gal with a hemorrhaging issue that comes and says, hey, or, or just touches his, his coat. Remember that? 
And then once he heals her, he goes and finishes the, the, the Jairus part. He goes and, and, and heals there too. Mark tends to clump these together. He'll start a story like a sandwich, put something in the middle and finish it. And it's always on purpose. He moves things around so we get this there's a theological purpose there. Well, it's pretty easy to, to figure out what the purpose is when, okay, there's, there's a child who's dying, and then there's someone who's spent all their money on a doctor, and the doctor can't do anything about it. Well, Jesus is big enough for both. So we, we learn about our Lord that way. Mark does that in particular. He's going to do that in the text today. So when we watch it, notice it's going to start with one story. Another one will get stuck in the middle, and then he'll come back and finish the first. And what Mark is teaching us here is vital for the church to get. It's one of those lessons that we need to understand, maybe, maybe now more than ever. Mark chapter 3, I'm going I'm to start in verse 20, but would you, would you pause and pray with me? Father, we thank you for today, and I thank you for your word. Would you teach us? Would you change us? all for your glory, and all through your resurrected name. Amen. Mark 3, verse 20. Jesus entered a house, and a crowd gathered again, so they weren't even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Here's the top part of the sandwich. The top part is Jesus is, he's in Capernaum, remember, small town, small houses, we've looked at that, and everyone wants to be around this, this young rabbi who's teaching in ways that folks aren't accustomed to. He's doing things that, gosh, they don't even make sense, they're so spectacular. And folks come to gather around, his family hears about that, and they go to put hands on him. We've got to stop what Jesus is doing. He, he, he must be out of his mind. I mean, why is he doing these things? Don't let what you know of the story override the reality of what's happening. Can you imagine being Mary? You, you brought the Messiah into the world. An angel told you about that. You've seen spectacular things, and now he's doing stuff that's going to get himself in trouble we need to go and we need to, we need to get a hold of him. And Jesus, let's straighten you out. Let's get you back in line. I mean, because crowds are coming to hear him. And honestly, he seems to be picking fights with the religious folks. Now, when you read this, here's another one of those things that those of us who have read the New Testament a number of times, you know, you read the term Pharisee or scribe and you almost hiss. You know, because you know they're the bad guys. Step into their world and no one thought that. The Pharisees are who everyone wanted to be. They were the ones that stand up and say, we're putting prayer back in the school. They're the ones who said, hey, the country is drifted away from God and we're going to make this right. And now Jesus seems to be arguing with them. Jesus, you, 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 you must be out of your mind. And, and then to add to that, his, his followers, he's got these, these disciples that he calls, they're a bunch of roughnecks. They're, they're not the ones that should be following him. And so they set out to, to stop him. Make sure we get this, that even though they're his family, they seem to be very disconnected from his work. And it teaches us something that familiarity doesn't equal following. Familiarity with Jesus doesn't mean that you're following Jesus. There was a, a kind of a famous preacher up in, in Minnesota, a guy by the name of John Piper, Baptist preacher. And I remember an interview with him because he's big into missions and supporting missions. They say, hey, how do you, you seem to have such a heart for missions? He said, well, I do love missions. He said, but that's not my greatest concern. This has always stuck with me. He said, my greatest concern is for those who go to church and assume they're Christians. Those who think they are, but they're really not. So we can be very familiar with Jesus, but, but not really 
follow Jesus. When, 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 when I was a kid, I grew up in church. You know, I think like my first word may have been Jesus. So I went to church as, 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 as a kid. I was brought up around that. I was on the, the, we called it Bible Bowl back then. I was on the Bible answer team. You know, I, that's what I did. And I wasn't following Jesus. I was around Jesus. I knew about Jesus. As a, as a matter of fact, when I was at work, since I had a familiarity with, with the Bible, I remember folks would come and they'd even ask me questions about God. It, it kind of be the, the Bible answer guy. But I wasn't following him. He wasn't my Lord. And that is a lesson that we have to get down. Because if he would have been my Lord, if, if I really were following Jesus, I would have been doing the things that Jesus was doing. Familiarity doesn't equal following. That's one of those things that, that ought to, to, to drive us, but let, we can't stop there, because remember, this is just the top part of the sandwich. Now we're getting to the middle. Look at verse 22. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. Okay, so now, it, scribes, let, let's go ahead and put this into to our language. The Bible professors. These are the guys who know Scripture really, really well. And they're going to step into the foray. Remember, his, his family, mom, brothers, and sisters have come because they're disconnected from his ministry. So now the Bible folks, the ones who ought to know better than anyone, and they say, oh, he's, he's possessed by Beelzebul or Beelzebub, depending on what, there's a couple different ways that could be. Here, that's kind of a funny name. Let, let's, let's say what that means. It means the Lord of the Flies. Re remember that book? So the, the Lord of the Flies, or to put it in kind of a crass language, it means the Lord of the Dung Heap. Oh, he's possessed by the, the king of the dung heap. Well, it's a, it's a way of referring to the devil. He, he's possessed by him. Matter of fact, he works for him. This always shocks me because the people who are the most familiar with God and, and, and notice something, they don't debate that he's done spectacular things. What they say is the spectacular things he's doing must be powered by the devil. We have to notice that. They don't try to discredit him. So never assume that Bible knowledge or even a display of the miraculous will lead to faith. Knowledge doesn't equal following. Knowing who God is doesn't mean that you're following what God wants or what God desires. Let me tell you something. That, that, that's an unfortunate reality that sometimes folks that, that should know God, that have been around God, that, that know about God, but they're not following God, uh, we end up bitter and angry. Folks who ought to be hope-filled and joy-filled end up bitter and angry. And you know what? This last year, has given us example after example after example of what it looks like to just see people mad. Folks who sometimes have been around God, who know about God, but we don't respond. And unfortunately, the church has been a part of that. The church, if you look across, we, we, we've been a part of that anger. We've been a part of some things that we should not have, have been in. These, these scribes, these biblical scholars, they remind us it's possible to know all about God, but to miss Him standing right there. I had a, I had a professor 
asked me uh, not too long ago, we, in, in, in a class, he said, if God were doing something right next to you, would you notice it? Would, would you even recognize what he was doing? This is an incredible problem for the church in America right now. And it's a problem that you and I have to get corrected. Yeah, you, we, we can complain about the world, but unless we're real, willing to start in here, we, we, we've missed the boat. We've got to start here and to make sure that we're not just familiar with God and that we don't just know about God, but that we're following Him because what's God doing? He's doing what He's always doing. He's loving the lost. He's helping the helpless. He's calling out hypocrisy. That's why if what Micah said, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. That's, that's what we do. Look, look, look at verse 23. He's not done. So he, Jesus, summoned them, and he spoke in parables. Because remember, Jesus always, Mark, Mark even said, Jesus, everything he taught, he taught in parables. He gave stories so that people could see it. Now, this story he's about to tell, it's one of those that you read and you kind of go, huh? And then you keep going. But if you slow down and look at what Jesus says, it, it's pretty incredible. He says... How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house can't stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he can't stand, but he's finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. So Jesus is reminding them first, their argument is self-defeating. It doesn't make sense. A, a house that's divided can't stand. Jesus can't be possessed by Satan and still working for Satan. That doesn't, that, that, or working against Satan. That doesn't make sense. He can't be both good and evil. The two don't work together. They're so filled with anger that they look at Jesus and they can't tell good from evil. So what, what's this story about the strong man? Get, get this picture. When he says a strong man, he's, re, he's referring to, to Satan. Satan is the strong man in the picture. Jesus is saying, you, you can't just walk into Satan's house and start taking what you want unless someone who's stronger comes in, ties him up, then he can do as he pleases. Then he can take what he wants. And what's God doing? God is the stronger. Jesus is the stronger man who walks in, ties him up, and he says, I'm taking back that which is mine. Well, what's that? It's you and me. It's us. People who, who have chosen sin. People have, well, you know your story. I know mine. I would have been powerless and you would have been powerless to, to, to go in and assume that we're going to take on Satan. That's why I always get a little freaked out when people are like, yeah, I'm going to do battle with Satan. I'm going, oh, how's that going to work out? No, 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 no. I'm going to get behind Jesus and let him do that. Because he's the stronger man. He's the one that does that. So we align ourselves with him. But at the end of the day, they, they're missing what's happening. They're so filled with bitterness, they look at Jesus and assume he's evil. Oh, Isaiah 5. Uh, verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, and who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. See, they're so mad that, that they can't even see what's happening right in front of them. They can't tell right from wrong anymore. I'll tell you what, that's a word for our day. I get so mad about things that we stop calling evil evil. The Bible says, woe, woe to the person that would do that. As Christians, we have to be willing to stand up and say, this is right and this is wrong. Not in some subjective kind of, well, what's good for you and what's good for me. No, according to God's word, according to the one who designed it all, this is right and this is wrong. We have to be willing to, to approach that. And it's gotten so bad for these guys that they see God in the flesh 
And they say, he's filled with the, the Lord of the dung heap. What a, what a sad, a sad statement. What, what, a, what a terrible statement because Jesus is now going to address that. Look at verse 28. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Boy, aren't, aren't you glad for verse 28? People will be forgiven for all sorts of sins and even blasphemy. But he's not done. But whoever blasphemes, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. I, I, when I read these, I think these are some of the scariest words in the Bible because Jesus looks at what has just happened and he says that won't be forgiven now or forever. You, you get the implication of that, right? Now, here, here's the deal. This is one of those verses that has caused a lot of anxiety where people go, well, hang on, have I done this? Have I? Let me tell you something. If you're worried about that, it's likely you haven't. You know, they looked at Jesus and said, he's filled with the devil. But I will say the road that gets to there is where we should be fearful. Not, not so much in this particular sin because that was in that time and that place. But if the church is unwilling to call good, good and wrong, wrong. That church is in trouble. And as people, we are in trouble. This is something that we have to take to take serious because knowing about God, knowledge does not equal following God. Oh, but now let, let's get back to the bottom part of the sandwich because remember his family still outside. Look at verse 31. His mother and brothers came and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him and said, look, your mother, your brothers, your sister, they're, they're outside asking for you. And he replied to them, who are my mother, my brothers? Looking at those sitting around the circle and he said, Here, here's my mother, my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. You know, you read that. That had to be a hard moment for Mary. You know, that, that had to, don't, don't get around the reality. That had to be a tough moment for her. Because she came with the intention of correcting her son. And she doesn't get to presuppose on that relationship at this point. And he says, no, no, no. Those who are following are, are, are my family. I, I can't help but to think back. What was it Simeon said to her? When, remember when they took little Jesus to the, to the temple and Simeon just starts talking about all these wonderful things that Jesus is going to do. And then he looks at Mary and he says, and a sword's going to pierce your soul. Oh, of course, it's, that's really going to happen at the cross, but I've got to think that first blood was drawn here. I've got to think that that had to be a hard moment. Remember, they're so disconnected from his ministry that they attempt to stop him. Familiarity doesn't equal following. Knowing about him doesn't equal following him. Genuine followers of Jesus are identifiable by their actions. They're the ones who are doing what he's doing. Following Jesus is, is having a faith in him that works its way out in our lives. It aligns our lives with not only his intentions, but his present actions. Following Jesus is following Jesus. Church, hear, hear, hear me. Make sure we boil this down to the simplest form that we can. Following Jesus has nothing to do with how much you know. Following Jesus has nothing to do with how much you've been around Jesus. Following Jesus is having a faith in Him that aligns your life with His work and His mission. That's what it means 
to follow him. And you go, okay, well, well what's his work? What's his mission? What did we do? Well, if we look at his life and we look at the way that the New Testament spells it out, we see that he says, hey, if you're following me, you're going to be active in evangelism and discipleship. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Remember, that's the marching orders for the church. All authority in heaven and earth, Jesus says, is given to me. Therefore, this is what you need to do. That's one of those proofs. Following Jesus means helping the vulnerable, not looking down on them. James 1.27 says, this is religion that God sees as is acceptable to, to, to help the widow and the orphan. In, in, in their world, you'll see the, the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. It shows that that's the most vulnerable in society. He said, this is religion. This is, put it another way, what it means to follow is when we're willing to help. To, to live holy lives, to live lives that are, uh, holy is one of those words, I, I guess it, it sounds kind of churchy. Let me, let me put it in a simpler way. That's set apart for God. A life that's set apart for Him. Evangelism, discipleship, helping the vulnerable, living holy lives. First Thessalonians 5.18, the last one, he says, be thankful. Christians above all should be the most thankful people. And you say, why, why is that? Well, because while I was still a sinner, God sent his son to pay the price for me and for you. And so that means that regardless of what happens around us, regardless of what's going on in the news or in D.C. or here or there or anywhere, regardless of that, I know how this story ends because Jesus holds it. And because we know how it ends, we should be the most thankful people that have ever lived. When you look at those things... You ever heard the old, the old saying, the proof's in the pudding? I can, I can talk about faith. I can talk about what I believe. I can talk about how I may have been around Jesus. But the proof of my faith is in the pudding. It's in the, it's in the way that it lives its way out. I, I, am I following him? Am I doing the things he do, he's doing? Am I taking evangelism and discipleship serious? Am I being a thankful person? Am I trying to live a holy life? Am I helping the vulnerable? These are those things. And, and what I don't want to do is create a list of the things. Well, hang on, I got to go do this. I got to go do this. I got to go do this. But if we're aligning our lives with His and this isn't working out naturally, there's something wrong in the soup. You know, there, there's something that's amiss. And the biblical word for that is we need to repent. We need to change what we're doing. We need to identify that because familiarity well, it doesn't equal following. Knowledge doesn't equal following. It's our prayer that those who call Thrive Church home would be so bought into Jesus that our actions tell the story of His love. That our actions, our lives, tell His great story. That we'd be the ones who are doing His will. So that when He wouldn't look and say, who's my family? He'd look over and say, that's my people right there. That's my people. That's my family. And in doing that, we will find hope and peace and purpose and joy that, that surpasses anything that the world would know. And I, I've got to say this. If you're, if you're watching or you're here and you don't know Jesus is Lord, I don't know what, what else I could say except this. Why in the world would you want to wait why not give your life to him now? 
and have peace and purpose and hope that's not an emotion but something that's, that's rooted in reality. That the depth of our sin is washed away in His gift. And the shame of life is not attached to us anymore because we'd be family of the King. And that all comes by trust in Jesus. If you don't know Him, don't, don't leave here today or don't get offline without, without, letting us, without reaching out for someone to chat with you today about that.